Hello and welcome to another uh, panel at our uh, virtual conference. Uh, this panel will be focusing on the legislative accomplishments in the last two years uh, for the LGBT community in New York. And I'm thrilled that we have our four openly LGBTQ state legislators uh, in New York with us. Um, I'm gonna introduce adduce people by the year they were first elected. So I'm gonna start with assembly member Deborah Glick she became the first openly gay person elected to the state legislature in 1990. She represents Lower Manhattan, neighborhoods like Greenwich Village and Battery Park City, and she is chair of the Higher Education Committee in the Assembly. Assemblymember Danny O'Donnell became the first openly gay man elected to the New York State Assembly in 2002. He represents neighborhoods of the neighborhoods of Manhattan Valley, Morningside Heights, and portions of the Upper West Side in West Harlem. And he is the chair of the Committee on Tourism, Parks, Arts, and Sports Development. Assemblymember Harry Bronson became the first openly gay member of the state legislature elected upstate when he first won in 2010. He represents parts of Rochester and nearby towns in Monroe County. And he's the chair of the Committee on Aging. And our, our last legislator is State Senator Brad Hoylman. He is currently the only member of the LGBTQ community in the State Senate. He was first elected in 2012 and he represents much of lower and midtown, midtown Manhattan and is chair of the Judiciary Committee. And finally, our wonderful moderator, uh, Dan Clark is the host and producer of New York Now since uh, January of this year. Uh, New York Now is a weekly statewide public affairs show on PBS stations. Um, I believe he's the first openly gay host of New York Now. And I am. Um, he <laughs> previously reported for PolitiFact, the Buffalo News, Capital Tonight, and the New York Law Journal. So I'm going to turn it over to Dan. Thank you. And thank you so much to the state court system for doing this. I think that this is awesome. And it's something that we don't really talk about here in the state press corps often enough. So I'm really excited to do this. As I'm looking at all of you, it's so uh, interesting to me that there are only four openly LGBTQ people in the legislature out of 213 people. And we can talk about that a little bit, but let's uh, start a little more broadly, I guess. Uh, so we passed marriage equality in 2011. A lot has happened since then. It's been a very busy past two years, I think. And I'd love for each of you to tell me about something that's passed in the last two years, or you know, even before that, that's meant really a lot to you, something that was really special. And uh, I guess we can start in the opposite order that we just went in. So uh, Senator Hoyleman, go ahead. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an honor to be here with my colleagues in the assembly, and especially, you know, Deborah Glick, who is, a landmark legislator in so many ways and had landmark legislation, which I'm sure she'll talk about, um, as well as, um, you know, Assemblymember O'Donnell and, and Bronson, both of them have passed landmark legislation this, this session. So, uh, you know, for me personally, and, you know, I think of, I think of Deborah and Danny and, and, and Harry's work and my predecessor's work, Tom Duane, you know, marriage equality was no doubt a high watermark for, for all of us. And for so many things that flowed afterward, it was really a matter of winning the Senate uh, by the Democrats. Uh, the Assembly has passed and repassed so many of Deborah's and Harry's and Danny's bills uh, on LGBTQIA rights, but they never had a Senate with whom they could work. Uh, you know, Assembly Member O'Dall and I couldn't even get some technical uh, um, changes to his original landmark marriage equality bill through the Senate, even though it, you know, even though they had already passed the um, um, the marriage equality bill. Basically, the Republican Senate, you know, blackballed any um, LGBTQIA legislation. I was literally told, Dan, if a bill had the had the acronym LGBTQ in it, it was off the table. They would not consider it by the Republican majority. So that's, that's how fervent, that was the reaction to marriage equality that unfortunately, you know, subsisted for, you know, eight years. Uh, but we had that breakthrough moment where the Democrats regained control. And now I'm a willing partner and I have the 
on the benefit of so many great bills that my colleagues in the assembly have passed multiple, multiple times. I would say on a personal level, um, and it was a contentious issue with my colleagues uh, and, and both houses, Democrat and Republican, was the passage of legalizing gestational surrogacy. Just, just from my own vantage point, having two children through surrogacy, thinking it as you know, the, the next horizon um, for LGBTQIA family making, and the fact that New York was an outlier, only three states in the country did not have any kind of any kind of laws, uh, and, and in fact, in, in, in New York was effectively criminalized. So I'm hopeful that that new legislation will really uh, impose regulations on surrogacy to make sure that it's safe to protect surrogates in really the point, I think the New York bill, uh, and uh, you know, I look in my daughter's eyes every day and, and think that, and hope, that you know, uh, other families uh, can be created, uh, if not through adoption or foster care, through surrogacy, depending on you know one's one's choices. Um, and then I would also uh, just just add that um, I'm very excited to be welcoming a new member of the LGBTQIA community to the Senate next year, and a person of color, Jabari Brisport from Brooklyn. So that's going to be transformative because let's face it, we're all white, um, you know cisgender um, uh, representatives here and the additional diversity I think is gonna go a long way and how we think about issues impacting our community. Uh, let's go to assembly member Bronson next, I think was the reverse order. Uh, what's, a, what's something that's passed in the last two years or I guess, you know, whenever that's been really special to you. Well, Dan, um, thanks for having me. And, and I too wanna thank um, assembly member uh, Deborah Glick and assembly member Danny O'Donnell, you know, Probably the most significant piece of legislation for me thus far has been marriage equality. And I was a freshman member and I remember um, meeting Danny in his office. He called me in, he had a spreadsheet and, um, you know, he, he said, you got to learn how to count. Here are the votes we have. Here are the votes we lost because of the Tea Party wave in 2010. Here are some senators and, you know, we, we got to get these votes. And, and, and Deborah, who um, right in the beginning, you know, came over to my desk on the assembly floor and said, this bill doesn't include domestic partnership. You, you can't vote for this bill. So, um, you know, their mentoring and, and willingness to really help uh, uh, the new kid on the block uh, was very welcomed. And, and since that time, working with them and with Brad um, has been especially important. Um, you know, I, I live by a philosophy that says uh, no matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, who you love, or how you identify, we all have dignity, and with that, we deserve full equality and justice. And so when I look at policy decisions, I always ask two questions. Will it move us closer to equity or remove barriers of, uh, to, to have equity? And all the bills that we passed this year that relate to our LGBTQ community, um, you know, did one of those two things, whether it was um, ensuring parental rights, allowing through surrogacy our um, uh, members to have uh, develop their families as they wish, benefits for veterans, um, making sure that in the um, children and family services arena and in the aging arena that we have uh, professionals in those disciplines, in those programs, that have some cultural competency training. Um, one of the bills that um, I got passed this year, um, all of them are about equity and justice. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, Brad shared the story of what he was told in the Senate. And he may recall that he and I passed a bill regarding the civil rights law and, and name change. And we had to, um, actually, it, it may have been a Senator Savino that, that ultimately passed it because um, uh, we asked her to carry it and she, um, you know, she couldn't emphasize the LGBTQ component of it. She had to emphasize the domestic violence um, component of it. And so now this year we have a, a bill that um, uh, has been introduced, not passed yet, um, but that is hopefully going to take us even further than what we were able to do a few years ago. So I, I'm just honored to be with this group of, of colleagues. Um, honored to do the work on behalf of our community, and um, and I'm, I'm glad we we're going to have another member in the Senate. Um, we need more members from upstate New York too. 
So uh, looking forward to our conversation. <laughs> it's really interesting to listen to both of you talk and just remember that for us, the people don't understand is that every aspect of society, whether it's nursing homes, whether it's education, for our community, there is a whole other layer above it where that people just don't understand that we have obstacles and we have barriers that just sometimes there's a ceiling and we can't break it. Um, but I didn't mean to interrupt Assembly Member O'Donnell. Thank you, Dave. Very nice to see you. Uh, Mr. Bronson, you apparently didn't get the memo. All New York electors are required to have the power broker behind them in their bookcase. And I can't find it <laughs> in your bookcase. So get on that, would you, Harry? Um, I'll work on that. Uh, it is, um, there has been quite a sea change, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, when I first arrived, um, my predecessor had been the chair of the higher ed committee, and he carried a bill that had to do with, um, it's like a bill of rights for students in colleges and universities that included LGBT people. And so I picked up that bill when he left. And I'm not making this up. The Pride Agenda came to see me to tell me that the Senate sponsor refused to pass the bill if my name was on it. And would I be willing to give the bill up to another Senator, another assembly member to get it passed? 2003 folks, that happened to me, okay? This year, I'm very proud because uh, any bill that involved our community, well, you had a regular wave of Republican no's. It made no difference what it did or whether it was needed. Um, and this year, uh, you know, when I passed marriage, I knew there'd be a backlash. I mean, passing marriage took me five years. It's five years of my life I won't get back. But now I have a wedding ring, so good for me. Uh, it took five years to, to repeal 50A of the Civil Rights Law. So again, sometimes things take a long time, but when the backlash came, it, it never occurred to me that the backlash would be directed at, at our trans brothers and sisters and around bathroom use. I mean, I, I could not for the life of me have expected that. So this year I passed a bill uh, and the Senate also passed that it's pretty simple. It says that if a, bill, if a bathroom has one stall and can be locked, anyone can use it. How novel is that, right? Um, and it was the first time ever a bill that acknowledges who we are. It passed without one no vote, not one. And that's the change. That's the change. And uh, it takes a lot of work. And I, you know, Deborah's little, but I stand on her shoulders because she did it for a decade before I got there, God bless her, all by herself. Um, <laughs> but it can be very hard. And uh, we absolutely need uh, more members of the community, more diverse, uh, more diverse members of our community to serve in the legislature. And Harry, I'd be happy to help you elect one from upstate. If you could just tell me where upstate starts, I'd be happy to get, get right on that. Uh, last but certainly not least, Assembly Member Glick. Um, when you've had the opportunity to listen to your wonderful colleagues, lots of uh, uh, thoughts come to mind and uh, memories of uh, when I first arrived, which shockingly was 30 years ago. Uh, and the legislature itself was enormously different. Um, not nearly as many people of color, uh, not nearly as many women, uh, and certainly no other uh, out queers. So it was a very strange and isolating place. I was very fortunate that a handful of the straight um, single people <laughs> hung out together uh, and um, befriended me. Uh, so I had some folks to, to hang with, uh, to go to dinner and stuff. Um, but I, I have to say that we as a community need to reflect upon the fact that it is 2020, but in New York State, 
the basic civil rights, uh, protection uh, against discrimination in housing, employment, public accommodations did not become law till 2002. Uh, and when I would debate this, I would repeatedly say, as a sitting member of the legislature, if I were in a county that had no protection or a town that had no protection, and I entered with a partner and we held hands, I could be asked to leave a restaurant. I could be refused uh, to sign into a hotel uh, as a sitting member of the legislature till 2002. So this was not just shocking, but terribly annoying. Uh, so we have come a very, very far way in a relatively short period of time. And I think the community needs to uh, pat itself on the back for its concerted efforts uh, to move forward. Um, Brad and I shared a bill on uh, banning conversion therapy. Uh, which shockingly uh, is allowed. It's a pernicious practice to try to change someone's sexual orientation. Um, and uh, Mike Pence running for vice, to be reelected as vice president, had diverted funds from AIDS work to support conversion therapy activities when he was governor of Indiana, and we should not forget that. So anybody who is gay and thinking of voting for Trump, Pence, shame on you, and um, a different kind of conversion needs to take place immediately. Uh, but we, we still have a long way to go. Um, we see with the Supreme Court uh, changing, not for the better, um, New York women are protected in their right to control their own bodies by virtue of uh, my Reproductive Health Act, which I am enormously proud of. Um, and I think that there, the marriage equality, uh, again, New Yorkers will be protected in their state, but we all have to be concerned about where things are going, which is why um, we're all political people, we're all legislators, we're all up for re-election, um, but we are also up uh, for seeing that there is a change in Washington because while we wanna protect New Yorkers, we can't protect them when they leave the state. So we need to depend on Washington, Washington to ensure that all of us will have our rights protected going forward. Thank you all for that very much. So this is obviously a, a panel sponsored by the, the state court system and three out of four of you are attorneys. So I know that you'll have some insight onto this. And I thought it was an interesting question just thinking of how I would experience the court system. And uh, we'll start with Senator Hoylman because he's chair of the Ju Judiciary Committee, but I'd love to hear from all of you on this. Do you think that LGBTQ people are treated fairly in the state's courts? Do we have the same access and treatment by the state's judiciary as cisgender heterosexual people? You know, I, I'm i sure we're not, um, just based on my own uh, investigation of the issue, uh, you know, forums that we've had um, but I think it points to a larger question, Dan, which is there's not a lot of data collection around um, the issue of uh, disparate treatment of litigants or others uh, who um, participate in the court system. We know that, for example, if you're an undocumented immigrant, um, you know, you potentially face arrest on your way to or, or from uh, court. Uh, but the bill that, that I carry um, uh, on uh, diversity reporting uh, among um, the court system and particularly its judges is actually awaiting the governor's signature as we speak. So I think it'll give us some important insight into that issue. Um, and I also, you know, 
as part of that diversity reporting will be transgender individuals. And we can't forget that, you know, we passed so much, again, thanks to the blockade that was broken in the Senate, uh, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, which the assembly had passed probably at least a half dozen times, if not more, uh, but we were finally able to get that across the line. And as, as Deborah was saying earlier, it's really hard to believe uh, that uh, we had, you know, the protections for, you know, gay and lesbian folks, but not transgender folks for the better part of a decade. And then, um, you know, only this session was that finally uh, passed. And, um, you know, just want to again, thank my colleagues in the assembly for fighting the good fight on that for so many years. So long and short, I hope the diversity reporting bill will change that. And I hope the governor signs that soon. Danny, can I go to you next? Because so you're the former chair on the correction committee and you also sponsored some really important uh, criminal justice uh, bills that were passed in some way, shape or form 50A most recently. And then before that, you were a sponsor of the no cash bail law. Uh, your version didn't actually become the final version, but it's an issue that's really important to you. Do you think members of our community, the LGBTQ community are treated fairly by the state's courts? I, I think it's different when you're looking at civil law versus criminal law, but you know, it's all part of the same court system, I guess. Uh, thank you. Well, clearly, uh, the answer is no, we're not. Uh, any marginalized community, any uh, minority community, however you define that, uh, that would be the case. Um, I spent seven years as a full-time public defender and was in those courts every single day of my life. And so um, there are a variety of levels um, of where the discrimination occurs. When I was corrections chair, I went on 38 prison tours um, all out across the state. And the first question I would ask to the superintendent was, do you have any trans people here? And if they did, the, I, I said, take me to them. And so I would give them my card and say, if you have any problems, you should call me and blah, blah, blah. And so um, obviously, um, LGBTQIA people have been targeted for generations in a variety of ways. Um, and that is not, uh, the courts don't exist outside of our society. They exist as an arm of it. And so um, there's a lot more work to be done. Obviously, uh, repealing 50A was um, a great accomplishment. And hopefully um, we will get to know more information about the interactions of police officers uh, with members of the community. I can tell you that I had a friend who was visiting from Atlanta and um, he had an interaction with a police officer who was, he was almost dragged into the subway station by a police officer because the police officer felt he was flirting with him. And fortunately, another friend was there who was a member of, he had a badge from Atlanta. And so the, they let him, they, nothing happened. But um, it happens every day in different kinds of ways, in different kinds of marginalized people. And we all need to stand together to stop what, wherever it occurs, including in the court system. Can I just ask before I move on, do we in New York, just I generally don't know, do we in New York have protections for trans people in state prisons and jails where um, the officials there, the staff have to uh, accommodate their gender or do we not have those protections in place? Oh, we don't. Um, please remember, there's a difference between a prison and a jail. Rikers Island is a jail. Yes. Um, Comstock or, you know, Attica is a prison. Um, and they have different legal protections. One is a, somebody convicted. One is primarily people who have been accused. Uh, no, we don't. And um, this is one of those circumstances where one size fits all won't do. Um, and so I did assist in getting some trans prisoners transferred from where they were to another prison um, because of uh, they felt they were getting uh, mistreated. Um, but we don't generally <laughs> give inmates many rights at all. And um, certainly if you are outside the norm, um, you, it's much harder to protect. Assembly Member Glick, uh, I know that you're not an attorney, but I'm sure that you have thoughts on how our community is treated by the state's court system. 
Um, yeah, well, I've played one for 30 years. So um, <laughs> uh, I think that we see uh, for many years, there are, uh, it starts with the interaction with the police. Uh, it moves to assistant DAs uh, and frequently, too frequently, it is uh, B-movie scripts that police seem to uh, gravitate towards. Um, and there was a terrible miscarriage of justice many years ago um, that had to do with uh, a lesbian couple that returning from a holiday uh, had a push-in robbery uh, as they were unloading their car one was murdered, raped and then murdered um, and her girlfriend was shot in the leg and the police believed that there was some third lesbian that was, it was some sort of triangle, you know, love triangle gone awry. Uh, with great deal of effort um, on the part of uh, some wonderful attorneys who are no longer with us, Catherine Abate and Paula Edelbrick, uh, we were able to uh, this was during the Giuliani administration, we were able to bring um, to bear some uh, force at which point they had never taken, a, they tried to um, blame obviously the girlfriend, but they had never allowed her to do a sketch. She knew what the perpetrator looked like, never offered her that opportunity. Subsequently, they, were forced to uh, allow a, a police artist. Uh, they identified the person who had subsequently killed somebody else. So if the police and the DA who had been pressing her to plead guilty to a lesser charge had acted appropriately, somebody else's life might have been saved. So the, the stereotypes that our community still has to deal with impacts the greater community because there is not a um, an understanding that uh, we are part of the greater society and if we suffer a misjudge uh, um, um, misjudges if a, there is a miscarriage of justice then in fact it can impact the greater community. And so I applaud my colleagues who work assiduously on the details of uh, criminal uh, law, uh, but we have a long way to go because stereotypes, um, racial stereotypes, uh, gender stereotypes continue to pervade uh, the criminal justice uh, world in general, from starting with the police and moving to the assistant DAs. So there's the other side of it too, the, the civil side of the course as well. And I know Assembly Member Bronson, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you practiced or currently practice, I'm not sure if you're still practicing, but you practice employment law, is that right? I'm not sure, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, <laughs> no, but tell me. Uh, you are correct. I practice um, employment and labor law, uh, many anti-discrimination matters. Um, and then um, after becoming an assembly member, I had my own practice, left the partnership and had my own practice where I predominantly represented um, individuals from our community. And um, in fact, the name change bill that uh, we passed into law a few years ago actually was the result of representing a trans man who wanted to change his name um, and was fearful of um, being harmed in his own home or um, having ridicule um, in the community that he lived and, and didn't want to um, have the, under the, that then law, a required publication of the prior name and the new name. Um, and through far too many hours of conversations with the law clerk ultimately got them to waive um, publication and to seal um, the public record. Um, but it was, it was problematic and it was unnecessary. 
And so that actually translated into a change of the law um, that uh, changed it so you did not have to prove as a petitioner um, that you uh, would be assaulted or you would be physically harmed if this was published. Um, and it was the mere fear was sufficient. So, um, you know, to your direct question about, um, you know, do we have the same access or the same treatment in the court system? Um, I think there's the resounding answer is no, both in the criminal court system as well as the civil court system. And, and there's a simple reason for that. Uh, because preconceived notions of sexuality, notions of what a family means, um, notion of what your role is depending on what your gender is, um, and, you, and you can go on and on. Um, all of those, as, as much as I think most judges try not to bring that into the courtroom, um, it's there. Um, and it's hard, just as we're all dealing with our own um, issues related to race as, as uh, uh, white um, uh, individuals, um, you know, judges have to deal with that too. And in addition, um, lawyers representing clients. I mean, I cannot tell you the number, now that I, I no longer practice, I stopped two years ago, um, but now the, the number of people who call me and say, I want a lawyer from our community because they'll understand me. Um, and it's real, um, it, it's perceived and that's a problem, um, but oftentimes it's real. And so um, just as we've passed laws requiring cultural competency by our state agencies, um, you know, we need cultural competency, competency um, by our lawyers and our judges. And um, so I would advocate for that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's a learning curve, I mean, um, you know, I'm still learning about um, sexuality and, and uh, identity and what those, I mean, um, young people like you, Dan, you know, you, you all get it much more than some of our, us older folk, you really do. Um, and <laughs> so, but, but it's, you know, we have a lot of folks in the judicial system, both criminal and civil, who just have not been exposed enough so that they fully understand it when they're either representing or a, a person from our community is before them and they're adjudicating an issue for them. Can I just ask you before we move on? So we passed GENDA last year, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act, which in theory and hopefully in practice is supposed to uh, provide a, a mechanism so that people don't discriminate people based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. Is that enough? I, I mean, I think about going out every day and if I did not have a job and um, I was applying for jobs and we just had National Coming Out Day in October, how fearful I would still be to tell a, a prospective employer in the job interview that I was married to a man mm -hmm. or you know, something as simple as going to my dentist. I wouldn't even want to talk about it. If they have a hook in my mouth, I don't know what's going to happen. Is that enough? Can we go further to somehow prevent discrimination in New York, do you think? It, you know, passing the law is a good step, but it's not gonna get us there, right? Civil Rights Act passed decades ago and we're still fighting right. those issues, right? We still have employers who, um, just because of the sounding of a person's name, that resume gets in the box, you know, the, the trash box, right? Um, and similar to our community, um, you know, there's lots of, I mean, it's unlawful to ask an applicant if they're married or not under New York State human rights law, right? So they're not supposed to ask that question, but there's ways to get to that, the answer to that question. And employers do that. Um, and so it, the law is good. If it's violated, then potentially you could bring a lawsuit, which is extremely costly. Um, from a financial standpoint, from a timing standpoint, and from an emotional standpoint. Um, so what we also have to be doing is continuing to educate um, employers uh, about the need to having a diverse um, uh, group of employees. And, and oftentimes larger employers get that. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's the larger employers and the really small employers 
because the real small employers, they typically see their employees as, as an extension of the family. Um, and the large employers get it because they have human resource you know, departments that deal with this and either are doing it because they know legally they got to and they don't want the cost of litigation or doing it because they've, they've um, done some diversity training and equity training and that has helped them. But um, you know, the law is a good first step, but we always have a lot more work to do. Uh, Dan, if I could just jump in and point Absolutely. out that in areas around sexual harassment, you know, we've passed uh, really very strong uh, laws requiring training uh, on a regular basis by all, all employers of, uh, you know, more than a, a minimal size. And um, the reality is that, you know, societal change takes a very long time. And we can see, as uh, Harry alluded to, uh, that the younger generation has, uh, in most instances, uh, have less hangups about um, racial diversity or uh, immigrant rights. These are still a struggle, and obviously we've you know, been through a terrible four years, but there is advancement, and society has made progress, and it is reflective in more diverse workplaces and an awareness on the part of employers that they need to do this because their customers demand it. Uh, and more and more, we see all kinds of intermarriage that makes that uh, more accepted uh, and filters through society in a way. And it was, um, you know, Martin Luther King who said, you know, you can uh, pass laws to prevent a man from lynching me, but you cannot change his heart and make him love me. So it is about a societal change. And I think we're in the midst of that. Um, hopefully I'll live long enough to, to see it realized more fully. And if, if I could just add, Dan, uh, you know, sure. Assembly Member O'Donnell had the, the Dignity for All Students Act. Uh, there's legislation now, which I carry to have a to have LGBTQIA history curricula. Uh, and, you know, so it starts at a very young age and we need to do a better job. I think the New York State Human Rights Commission needs to do a better job in information sharing. Um, one of the unfortunate cuts uh, in this year's budget uh, was to LGBTQIA groups that actually wanted to institute uh, a public awareness campaign around gender. So we're going to have to do a lot of balancing and we're not going to see the progress unless people know their rights, unless New Yorkers know their rights. And that unfortunately has been on the budget uh, chopping block. That's really interesting. Um, kind of a, a segue of what assembly member Glick was saying. I'm really curious because a few of you mentioned it at, at the top. Uh, I'm curious because, so we have you four in the legislature out of 213, as I said before. We now have an openly gay man on the State Court of Appeals, which is the state's highest court. But we still see in the state's court system among judges, there are not very many LGBTQ judges, I think it's fair to say. And obviously we don't have a lot in the legislature. And just among elected officials statewide, we don't see a lot. And I'm curious, just starting with Assemblymember Glick, um, do you think that that's impeded, how do you think that's impeded progress for priorities for our community? And I'm curious about what has happened over the years when you first started, how those issues were perceived by your colleagues? Because I have to imagine it was much harder to um, even explain back then than it is now. Well, I would just say that um, a lot of the progress we made uh, at local levels were focused on um, a lot of m local activism that uh, got into the weeds of uh, how judges get selected in various communities, uh, how um, they get nominated, and there, there was a very concerted push, at least in parts of New York City, to ensure that any advancement of judges included more balance um, and 
uh, as you point out, you know, Paul started, Paul um, Feynman started in civil court and he won a race in um, our community, the, the community Brad and I represent. And then there was a Supreme Court opening and, you know, people gathered around that. I think that there may be less of a focus uh, in the community on that. And it's shifted to um, legislative races and congressional races. And um, when I started, there were a, literally a handful of us across the country uh, in state legislatures. Uh, and the advancement in across the country is actually quite dramatic. Uh, so I think the focus shifted somewhat. Uh, at least that's my perception in New York, uh, that people have gotten more on the uh, legislative and congressional focus. Uh, uh, and not on the judicial focus. At least that's my sense. No, I think you're exactly right. Um, Assembly Member O'Donnell, I'd love to hear from you on that, how people have uh, interacted with you over the years in the legislature. And if you uh, think that maybe progress has been impeded because of that. I have been told I can be a bull in a china shop. <laughs> I can't dispute that, really. Uh, I have been blessed with a sense of humor, which comes in handy. Um, uh, uh, when I fought for marriage, I flirted with my Republican colleagues. I told one he, had, he was the most handsome man in the place. He had owed it to the gays to vote yes. And much to my surprise, there was then a fight among the Republican legislators because they all thought they were the best looking man in the House. <laughs> I, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Um, but when I first got there, people actually said to me in 2003, I don't know any gay people. And I would say, do you leave your house? Do you get your hair cut? Like, I, I don't even understand how that could be, right? And slowly but surely, that changed when, when the, the fights before marriage were all like, well, you know, there's this cousin. I hear, I, if I could tell you the number of people in our, in our house, who I learned who the gay relative was in the process of trying to pass marriage. And that's all helpful. You can't um, treat someone with dignity and respect if you don't acknowledge that they're there, right? And so that was part of the move and the change. Um, you know, we should have more. If there's 200, we should have 30 members in this caucus, and we don't, and it's hard. Um, first of all, it's hard because we're not always loyal to each other. The community is not always loyal to us. Um, and that's a problem. And, um, you know, I was trained by Deborah. We stand together and we pick ourselves up. And someone came to me my first year and asked me if I thought Deborah was right. I didn't even know what the issue was. The, the answer was Deborah's right. Now let me go find out why. Because otherwise, there's no way we can win. There's too many people trying to cut us up. So in the end, um, we need more elected officials. We need more judges. Deborah and I helped Paul Feynman get on the bench. Deborah and I helped Paul Feynman get to the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm very happy that he's there. Um, and in my own role in New York County, when it comes time to that there are vacancies, I want to make sure um, that we're on the list. I once um, loudly told Governor Patterson that I expected whenever there is an appointment available that a member of our community is included. I said, you don't have to pick him or her, but there's got to be somebody, fill in the blank, that, that's qualified for that job who's a member of our community. And, and if you don't include them in the list then the perception is that we're not. Um, and that was actually the, around the, um, the Gillibrand appointment. And um, he ended up interviewing me, but that's a longer story. I don't want to get into that, but it was never going to be me. But I thought it was important that Randy Weingarten and I were included in a list because in the end, if we don't demand to be included, 
then we're never going to get to where we need to go. Uh, if I could just point out that what we we also have, and it's a problem within the community, is that after 30 years, I'm still the only lesbian. Um, yeah. And, uh, there, the community um, politics is about money, uh, and the money that is, uh, it's harder for women to raise money, and the community... Uh, there is a level of sexism in the community that makes it hard uh, for women to move forward. Uh, so I think it at least has to be acknowledged. Uh, God knows there was sexism in the legislature in general, um, but within our community, there still um, needs to be some discussion and some honesty about um, the, uh, the role gender uh, plays uh, and the fact that uh, it is seemingly more difficult uh, for lesbians to um, raise money and get the kind of support uh, that uh, sometimes accrue to uh, men in the community. Let me just add, Dan, like, sorry, if you hear the Wizard of Oz in the background, like a good gay dad, that's what my uh, kids are currently <laughs> watching. But um, wanted, you know, 75% of, um, of judges are white um, in, in the state of New York. Meanwhile, 55% uh, of New Yorkers are, are white. So we really are not reflecting the um, racial diversity of, uh, of, of the population on the bench. And um, I'm pretty sure we're not reflecting the, uh, the diversity and sexual orientation. Fact is, we really don't know. Uh, so we, we need to drill down on those statistics. You know, they always say you can't um, manage what you don't measure. And there's no real, you know, reporting uh, currently being done around judicial diversity. And uh, I would think that's that's a that's something that New York could follow states like California in instituting to make sure that the state this bench is reflective of our population, both in uh, race, uh, gender, and sexual orientation and gender identity. Do we know? Do we know what it looks like on the state appellate courts? I have no idea because I guess I've never gone through them. I know that you've only been judiciary chair for the past couple of years, but have you looked at all? And I know we might not know, but like in terms of the this current governor's appointments to those appellate courts do we see our community represented there at all no, largely no and partly because um we've uh well particularly it's particularly bad in the in the court of claims uh, because a lot yes. of the appointments have been holdovers from previous years so i think we just need to be more aggressive about our insistence and i know we were this year in terms of latino appointments uh, but every, you know, every group in, in New York needs to be represented. Uh, and that, unfortunately, it's still a hangover from the Republican Senate. And again, the assembly, you know, appointments uh, were not their bailiwick, uh, but uh, it's up to the well, Senate. We, don't get it. we have no role in appointments. Senator. Exactly. So no exactly. one ever, right. in my opinion. So. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so it's the Senate's responsibility now. You're seeing some movement but we have to move more quickly i think that's um that's acknowledge so dan um yeah i don't i i want to make sure we didn't miss deborah's point um we have a lot of work to do in our own community um you yes. know the 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 lack of diversity um and representation from our community and all kinds of things agencies and you know, the judicial um, rank and file um, in our legislature. Um, and that really, um, you know, I'll, I'll just, I want to point out one thing, historical thing. I used to be a member of the Bar Association for Human Rights of Western New York. Um, there's a reason it was called human rights. What it was, was a bunch of gays and lesbians um, and no trans at that time, but gays and lesbians who were in the legal field, who would not 
were unable to come out at the time. Sonda hadn't been passed. Um, and, um, you know, and, and at that point, we were trying to deal with being part of a legal system that wasn't welcoming and uh, affirming of who we were. We still have that, and we still have within our own um, community, um, we're not immune from the sexism. We're not immune from the racism. And we have to come to grips with that. So um, three years ago, I started a, a, an organization. It's called the uh, Greater Rochester LGBTQ Political Caucus. Um, and the whole point there is to get people who are interested in running for office or being appointed to some governmental office or just being involved in politics um, to learn what it takes um, to be exposed to situations where they can build their network. And for those of us who are already established for us to help them build their network. We have intentionally included um, or tried to recruit more women, more people of color and people who are interested in running for judicial office. Um, we have a couple of city court judgeships coming up and you know, we have um, members of our community who are um, lining up to run for those seats and doing what it takes to build that foundation in that network. But we have to um, be cognizant of and uh, we have to take affirmative steps to include more women and include more people of color um, from our community and, and to assist and mentor and support those individuals so that we'll have diversity um, in these offices, in these judicial seats um, that represents the true diversity of our community. Totally, I think it's all intersectional and especially you look at our community, LGBTQ is just like this giant umbrella where it, myself is a, a gay cisgender man, I have no idea what the experiences are of a trans person of color because we're just living totally different lives with totally different challenges. And that kind of brings me up on my last question because we're coming up in the hour is a lot of people look at our community and they see that we got marriage through the Supreme Court and they say, oh, what else do you need? <laughs> what, what else is there for you guys? Like what unique challenges can we address either legislatively or administratively. Um, so I guess that's the last question I'll pose to each of you is what's next? What would you like to see happen? And I know we touched on a little bit, but I'd love to give you more of an opportunity to talk about it. And uh, let's start with Assemblyman O'Donnell. Well, uh, the Supreme Court didn't give us marriage. We got marriage on our own. Right, that's true. Yes. And uh, unfortunately for where we are, Oberfell may be or reversed by a new Supreme Court, which won't affect New Yorkers because we did it legislatively. So I think that we have to be very cognizant of the fact that some of the rights and benefits we have in New York be back to our brothers and sisters in other states. Um, I think in New York, we need to fight to ensure um, that the diversity that Deborah talked about is actually real, right? And so in the end, um, it just can't always be rich white men with trust funds who speak for us. Now, that's not my experience, obviously, nor Deborah's, but the reality is we need to broaden who and what that is. And what I will say to you, Harry, is that if you get a list of judges that you're helping in Rochester, count me in. I'm in. Because we have to stick together and ensure that, that, that diversity continues to move forward. If we do it statistically, we should have a 30 member caucus in Albany, not five. And so, you know, sometimes that's hard. You know, I, I endorse Melissa Sklars, even though she was running against one of my colleagues um, because I believed in that diversity. Um, we have to be open to hearing from people throughout the state. And again, have you never answered the question, where does upstate begin? So um, if someone could tell me that, I'd be very happy in trying to get more upstate members. <laughs> the lasting question of where does upstate begins? 
<laughs> I, I, I can't even venture to answer that question because depending on whether we're talking, um, you know, construction work and prevailing wage, or we're talking about minimum wage, or, or you know, it, it, it varies every time we try to define it. <laughs> One thing's for sure, yeah. it, it's not Westchester, okay? It's, that's, that's well. not upstate. <laughs> Uh, we'll go with you, Assemblywoman Glick. Well, I think some of it is making real some of the things we've already done. Uh, Danny O'Donnell passed um, a, a wonderful educational uh, bill that would be, you know, about oh. teaching uh, students at every, in an age appropriate fashion, about bullying dignity for all students. It's not been fully implemented. We are so far from it being implemented. Uh, some of it is about making certain that uh, there are in-service teachers. These are teachers who may have been doing the work for 20 years and it's harder to get them on, uh, on board. But we also have to get new teachers who are being trained. So it's about getting colleges to ensure that part of their curriculum in their education programs make certain that teachers are more comfortable dealing with those issues. We still have terrible bullying problems in uh, elementary school and high, uh, right through high school. So uh, that I think is probably something that we need to be more aggressive and more focused on because that is about the societal change getting young people. There's the, um, since we're all gay, uh, South Pacific, uh, um, you have to be carefully taught. You have to be taught to hate, right? So um, Lerner and Lowe knew it, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein knew it. Those kinds of things are things that we, so I, I think that's gonna be the focus for a while and making certain that our state agencies that deal with young people um, are responding to the needs of young people in an appropriate fashion. Uh, as uh, Harry said, uh, cultural competence for our community as well. Totally, uh, Assemblyman Bronson. Sure, I, I think that um, we need to focus on the intersectionality of our um, friends and family that are part of our community. And as, as you said previously, Dan, um, you know, I have a perspective, cisgender, gay, uh, white male. And that's very different than um, members of our community who are of color it's very different than women in our community. Um, it's very different than people with disabilities in our community. So we, we, we need to focus more on intersectionality. And then that leads us to the next issue. We have to constantly remind ourselves that every societal issue that's out there, every economic issue that's out there, whether it's access to health care, whether it's access to a good paying job with benefits, whether it's housing, um, education, you can go on and on. Our community has every one of those issues. And we need to, when we're thinking about what are the programs we're going to address for homelessness, we need to think of our young LGBTQ plus individuals who are currently runaway and homeless and their percentages are much higher than other demographics. Um, when we're talking about health care, we need to think that if we're doing something with this Medicaid thing called th uh, 340B, that has to deal with health clinics that are Ryan White clinics. We need to think that when we're looking at education, if we don't address bullying in education, we're not gonna help our young people. So I think we always have to recognize that um, every policy decision we're taking, we should look at what's the impact on our LGBTQ plus community and how can I um, create more equity or lead us toward equity there 
um, in making that decision. So um, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, I, I know my colleagues are up for it, and I, I certainly am. <laughs> Senator Hoylman, to close us out. Yeah, just to say, uh, you know, again, it's, it's true, even though it's been said uh, before, I'm standing on the shoulders of all these colleagues who have been in the legislature longer than I, and uh, I benefit from uh, now having a lot of Democratic uh, colleagues and a Democratic majority to pass some of these bills. But um, certainly the point I would strongly agree is that um, our community, um, while in some respects different, uh, is very much the same with so many others in terms of suffering uh, during COVID-19, joblessness, poverty, discrimination, um, and um, the issue of, um, uh, of you know, disproportionate impact of, of, of systemic racism. Um, so uh, legislation like repealing the so-called walking while trans ban, uh, ensuring that LGBTQ youth um, are have the resources to to um, to battle depression and and suicide ideation, uh, ensuring that our seniors uh, who are in nursing homes um, are also given protections like they are in other states if they're LGBTQIA, um, and um, ensuring that um, not only do we elect more. Um, representatives who reflect the diversity of the state, including our community, but that we nominate more judges who do the same. And so I think that's um, something that I want to be focused on through data collection and reporting and making sure that we know um, uh, what the percentage is of LGBTQIA uh, judges. We don't have that information. So it's very hard for us um, to, uh, to have the policies to implement change. So the data bill is, um, it has not passed yet or it has it hasn't been, it's passed those it. houses. It hasn't been signed. And it hasn't been signed. Okay. All right. Uh, well, that's all the questions I have for you guys. Are you feeling inspired? I'm feeling very inspired. <laughs> thank right. you, well, thank you all so much for doing this. Thank this you. is awesome. We should do this thank more you, often. Man. We should with a cocktail, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so <laughs> or much. Or two. Thanks very yeah, much. Everybody, stay safe. You too. Too. Thank you all. I appreciate it.